All right, everybody. So, welcome back. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Greg Davidson, the head of the geology department here at Ole Miss. And tonight we have the honor of listening to him speak about his book, With Faith in Science for Life. So, if you'll please give him your undevoted attention. So, my little clock that I put up so I can keep track of it how long I've been droning on is, uh, is not working. So I guess that means that there's no time limit tonight. <laughs> we are talking about hey, yeah, yeah, we got timekeepers up front. Uh, so I didn't necessarily know how formal an occasion this was, so just in, just in case you're thinking that, that I'm underdressed, Geologists do not get taken seriously <laughs> when they're wearing a suit. <laughs> so this is very formal for a geologist. Right, so Austin asked me to, to come and talk to you all about this subject related to my book, When Faith and Science Collide, which may make the title up here seem a little bit odd, because it almost seems to say something opposite, reconciling friends. But in fact, what we're going to see is that those are two different approaches at getting at some of the same questions about whether faith, particularly Christian faith, and science are inherently at odds, and if it's even possible to reconcile them. Now, my intention this evening is not just to give you an academic lecture that you may or may not stay awake through, but to try to make it very practical. Where we're looking at some fundamental questions about considering things like whether the natural realm is really all there is. Or if it's rational to think that there could be something that is beyond just the natural realm. On the subject of faith and science, it has become so polarized in Western society that if I had met everyone at the door and said, are you for science or are you for religion, you probably would have answered one way or the other. We could have said, are the science folks over here and the religious folks over here? With, of course, I'm sure there's a few of you that are rebels and would insist on sitting in the middle, you know who you are. <laughs> An analogous question, though, I would suggest would be for me to meet you at the door and say, do you carry out cognitive thought or do you carry out biological function? You know, is, is that a trick question? Cognitive thought, is it over there? Biological function, is it over there? But in fact, that's an absurd question, because those are not mutually exclusive. Those are just different characteristics of a human being. I would suggest that science and religion are not, or are very similar in the sense that they are, in fact, different characteristics of the same reality. Hopefully that will make a little bit more sense as the evening unfolds here. So this title presupposes something. Reconciling friends. That implies that there was a time in the past where science and faith were not at odds. They have been temporarily estranged, and there is perhaps some potential for reconciling them. Now, with that analogy, any time there is a strained friendship, that usually means that there are one or more misconceptions, or at least one party, if not both, and that reconciliation is going to be aided by identifying what those misconceptions are and seeing if we can correct them. So this evening we're going to look at three misconceptions, or things that I'm going to argue at least are misconceptions. Those are, as science advances, the need for God diminishes, that religion has always held back scientific advancement, and the third one, modern science and the Bible in particular, have become mutually exclusive. Maybe they were in the past when our scientific knowledge was not advanced enough, but now we're finding a point where they're mutually exclusive. So the first one, misunderstanding one, that science advances the need for God to reach us. The idea here is that long ago, when we didn't understand very much about the way nature worked, 
people saw all of these things that they couldn't explain, like crazy weather patterns. And because they had no explanation for those patterns, they assigned them to the gods. So most of what they experienced, they didn't understand. It was assigned to God or gods. And a very small part of their experience was understandable. As science advances and we start understanding more and more things, less and less needs to be explained by capricious gods or, or deities. And so over time, the idea is that what we have to assign to the gods shrinks, and people are thinking that eventually we'll get to the point where we can understand everything and come up with natural explanations. We don't need God anymore. I'm going to suggest that science, and I am a scientist, that science being limited in scope to that which is constrained within the bounds of time and space, meaning the natural realm, cannot directly address that which might lie beyond those boundaries. What do we mean by that? Let's think of everything that we assign to time and space, matter and energy, as being inside of a box. So here's our box. It contains time, space, matter, and energy. The kinds of questions that I can ask scientifically about time and space and matter and energy include things that relate to how and when. I can ask, how does a star form and emanate its energy? I can ask, when? There are scientific methods that I can apply that may tell me or give me some way of estimating when a star is going to be. But suppose I ask the question of why. Why is there something and not nothing? Why is the nuclear binding energy just right to allow molecules to exist? Why is the gravitational force just right to allow planets to stay in orbit about a star and neither cycle in to collide with the star nor to wander off through frozen space? Can I use scientific methods to answer the question of why? <coughs> No, I can't really. And if I were to add to that, is there perhaps a who? Whether that is God, whether that's the existence of angels or demons, that could possibly lie beyond the boundaries or confines of three dimensions of space and time. I don't have tools within this box to actually be able to test what might lie on the outside. I'm fascinated by this classic work called Flatland. It's a very thin book by a guy named Edward Abbott. And he claims that the author is actually A squared. In Flatland, this is a two-dimensional world where people are polygons. There are triangles, there are squares, there are pentagons, and the priestly class are, are circles. And we have one one female here tonight, right? Okay, so a, a little caveat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'll understand why I just asked that. I'll tell you that in this book, Flatland, his females in this two dimensional world are lines, which doesn't leave them very much room for a brain, so they're not very smart in his world. Although he does say that in three dimensional space, that females are, are actually intelligent. But in two-dimensional world, eh, not so much. <laughs> so in Flatland, <coughs> we have this, you know, only two dimensions. Here is a, in this case, a circle that's representing a person in Flatland. And this person can go inside their house, close their doors, and think that they are completely invisible to anyone that's in the world. They can go left, they can go right, forward, back. But in fact, then they have no words and no concept for up or down. And along comes a sphere, a three-dimensional being that is not constrained within this two-dimensional space. When he's, he can look right inside the house that this person thinks that they are 
and no one can see them with all the doors closed. And when the sphere speaks, the circle thinks that they're hearing this voice from inside their own head. And if the sphere chooses to enter this world, what's the first thing that's going to appear? It's a question. Point. Uh, a point that then is going to look like a rapidly growing person who appears out of nowhere. That seems quite miraculous, and yet, at least to sphere, it all makes perfect sense. And he can pass through this plane and interact with the people that are inside here. So this is somewhat analogous to how we might view our ability to conceive of something that might fly beyond our experience of three dimensions of space and time. What if there were fourth dimensional beings that could interact with our world? We might be able to see them when they're interacting. We can't when they're not. Now, nonetheless, there are folks that think that they can apply scientific principles in order to explain away anything remotely supernatural. We have books like this, The Faith Instinct, How Religion Evolved and Why It Endures. Religion Explained Through Naturalistic Terms. Dennett's Breaking the Spell, Religion as a Natural Phenomenon. And of course, the much more well-known Dawkins series that includes The Blind Watchmaker and The God Delusion. Now, I've read both of these books. Starting with The Blind Watchmaker, I read this honestly interested in what his rationale would be for how you could use science to explain the way it <coughs> Now, why the evidence of evolution reveals a universe without design? When he's describing evolution, he actually does quite a, a nice job. So if you wanted to understand how evolutionary theory works, he does a pretty good job of explaining it. I finished the book still waiting to see how is this explaining away God. I had to go back and revisit it to realize, oh, he's got this sentence in the middle of the book. It says the basic idea is that we don't need to postulate a designer in order to understand life or anything else in the universe. I can paraphrase that as basically saying, if I can conceive of a natural mechanism, God didn't do it. So if I can conceive that, okay, a planet revolves around the sun because of a gravitational force, I can measure that gravitational force, I can predict its behavior, and because of that, God didn't make it that way. That doesn't strike me as a particularly logical argument, especially when I realize that, do I understand why gravity exists at all? Do physicists understand why gravity exists? No, they don't. Right now, no one knows why gravity even exists at all. Based on this reasoning, I guess we have to say, oops, I guess God now has to exist because there's something about nature we can't explain yet. Which is also not a logical argument. The God delusion, basically boils down to looking at this idea of infinite regress. In philosophical terms, considering the existence of, of God, the infinite regress argument for God goes something like this, that for every cause, or for every action, there's a cause. And so if the universe exists, there had to be a cause. So you go back to the Big Bang, the universe came into existence, it needed a cause. So if there's a natural mechanism that brought that about, well, you can back up before that, and that needed a cause. And you keep doing that infinitely, and you have this problem that you have to, you have to keep going back infinitely in time. It's called the infinite regress problem. So Richard Dawkins addresses that by saying, you theists have the same problem. Because this God that created this incredibly complex universe had to be even more complex himself. And who made God? You have the same infinite regress problem. Except that all the theists look at this and say, wait a minute. What you have done is you have taken this box with space, time, matter, and energy. 
and you've taken the question of God, and you have forced him inside the box. That I have to be able to define God and look for him within those three dimensions of space and time, using the tools of science. And when I do that, I can't find him, therefore he doesn't exist. But hopefully you've seen the, the logical fallacy there, that we disallow the possibility of something that is beyond time and space. Somebody or something that has actually created and brought into existence time, space, matter, and energy. That inside that box we're not going to be able to test. So, fundamentally, rejection of God cannot be a logical consequence in scientific inquiry, simply because science can't reject that which it cannot test. Ironically, Stephen Jay Gould, who was an atheist, at one point, in a moment of, of honesty, had this to say. Actually, I'm not implying that, that Stephen Jay Gould is a dishonest person. He's a brilliant scientist. Science simply cannot, by its legitimate methods, adjudicate the issue of God's possible superintendence of nature. I mean, science cannot address whether God has put <coughs> things into motion uh, and created it. We neither affirm nor deny it. We simply cannot comment on it as scientists. If some in our crowd have made untoward statements claiming that Darwinism, that Darwinism disproves God, then I will find that this is the enemy and have their knuckles wrapped for it. He went to a, a Catholic school and had many occasions of having his knuckles wrapped by the nuns. All right. Misunderstanding two. So hopefully this gives you some hope. This is not going to be an instrumental talk because we're probably up there to through it. Uh, this idea that religion has always held back scientific advancement. This is summarized pretty well by this guy, Andrew Dickinson White. In all modern history, interference with science in the supposed interest of religion, no matter how conscientious such interference may have been, has resulted in the direst evils both to religion and to science. So sort of summarizing this idea that you start mixing science and religion, you just do harm to both. It notes the date on this, 1896. That gives you the impression that any time someone has expressed religious convictions, that it has caused harm to science, or science has not advanced if they felt that way. But if we just go back and look at some historical figures, say somebody like John Ray, are any biologists in here? Biology majors? Okay. Do you run across this name? Okay, your major in large part exists because of this man. <laughs> John Ray is considered by many to be the father of modern biology. He is the one who came uh, set the foundation for the classification system. He's the one that came up with the definition of a species. Uh, was phenomenally productive in his study of nature and one of the most respected scientists of his day. Here is his seminal work published shortly after his death. Somebody read this top part for me. Let me in the front row here. Yeah, read it out loud. Uh, the wisdom of God manifested in the works of creation. Obviously, maybe. Or at least somebody who was able to completely separate his faith from his <coughs> The wisdom of God manifests. This is the title page. I'm just, as a scientist in the 21st century, I just try to imagine if I sent a manuscript in for publication to a scientific journal, and, and the front page had that on it. Isaac Newton, considered even by those who are completely antithetical to any religious belief, will still acknowledge Isaac Newton as one of the greatest minds of all times. Um, we, we talk about things like Newtonian physics. By the way, there's a misconception that in, as a science advances, Things like Newtonian physics have been overturned and replaced by quantum physics. That is not true. Newtonian physics is still alive and well. It's not until you get to the subatomic level, or at least the atomic level, that Newtonian physics stops being applicable and you have to shift over to quantum mechanics or quantum physics. At the larger scale, 
we're still using Newtonian physics every day. This was one of his seminal works, Math Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. Uh, this is in the foreword, or not the foreword, the, the introduction to this work. This most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets, so he's talking about the orbiting of the planets, <coughs> could only proceed from the council and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. And if the fixed stars are the centers of other light systems, these being formed by the light wise council must be all subject to the dominion of one. This being governs all things, not as the soul of the world, but as Lord over all. Isaac Newton was intensely religious. And some have argued that he actually wrote more theology than science. So clearly, with some of these very powerful historical figures, we somehow didn't see this destruction of good science because of religious belief. So let's consider two things. Um, one is, do we have examples of where religious belief has actually enhanced science? And do we have examples of where a failure to accept a religious belief actually hindered science? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> We're going to look at one of each. <laughs> James Hutton, one of the founding fathers of my discipline, theology. Uh, we're going to look at where his religious belief actually facilitated the development of modern geological understanding. And the eminent Albert Einstein, where some of his rejection of religious beliefs actually hindered the advancement of modern cosmology, where cosmology is, is the, the study of the fabric and the origin of the universe. So, James Hutton first. Hutton, if you read an introductory textbook in geology, say in, in the wonder level class that I may teach, you'll find quotes like this. No vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end. For Hutton was looking at the natural world and seeing in it evidence of cycles where rocks are made and broken down, and <coughs> broken down again, mountains are uplifted and worn down. And he did, in fact, make this uh, observation where he did not see any vestige of the beginning uh, or prospect of an end to the cycle. What those textbooks don't usually point out is that, now in Hutton's case, he was not a Christian. He was a deist, meaning he kind of thought that, that God got things going and then was somewhat detached from the process. But nonetheless, he believed that there was a creator that endowed his creation with regenerative powers so that it wouldn't just peter out and cease. And so he was actually looking for these regenerative powers, and he was one of the first ones to find evidence of mountains having been lifted up and worn down, and lifted up again and worn down in these successive ages. So actually his religious conviction led to being able to, to see and identify some things that were going on in nature. And he had this to say, that you're also not going to find in any of those textbooks. We perceive a fabric erected in wisdom to obtain a, a purpose worthy of the power that's apparent in the production of it. We are led to acknowledge an order not worthy of divine wisdom. Albert Einstein, the cosmological constant, this, this is a fascinating story. So 1917, you've got all of this, these advances in scientific understanding that led to Einstein being able to develop this mathematical model of the universe that was very elegant. It allowed all kinds of predictions that no one would have guessed. Things like the fact that space could be bent. You can bend space by gravity. Mm -hmm. So he said, empty space, as a, say a planet comes into line with my view, that space itself would be bent in such a way that starlight, if I'm looking at a distant star, and I see it in a particular place in the sky, that as a planet came for the moon and passed close to my view, that, that space would bend enough where the position of that star would seem to shift. Now, not enough where you could see that with the naked eye, but with telescopes and the right equipment, you potentially could. 
so that it led people to actually carry out that experiment. And one particular point in history where there was a solar eclipse that allowed them to have the, the sun and the moon lined up, which should maximize the bending of that space and still be able to see the star because it was now dark. And it's pretty cool, by the way, that the moon exactly matches the diameter of the sun at those different distances. Pretty remarkable. And sure enough, the position of those stars look like they should be. So Einstein's model predicted accurately the bending in space. But there was a problem with this model. The problem, all the, the, the model also suggested that the universe was expanding. Now conventional understanding at the time was that the universe was infinite both in time and extent. Infinite extent that you, no matter which way you went, you would just find more and more and more universe. And infinite in time. That had always been there and always would be. And actually, science, secularists and, and religious folks didn't really have a big debate there because the atheists would say it's just always been, and the theists would say that's just the way God created it, infinite in space. Well, this model <coughs> implied that the universe was expanding. He had a great deal of difficulty with that on philosophical grounds. And in fact, one of his colleagues agreed with him and had this to say, that philosophically, the notion of an abrupt beginning to the present order of nature is repugnant to me because what they realized was, if the universe is expanding, you turn the clock around backwards, that the universe all has to coalesce at a single point, which means it had to have a beginning. That smacked a little bit too much of a creator and it created an event. And so people like Arthur Eddington and Einstein advocated the insertion of the cosmological constant into the equation, which effectively made it a static universe. Shortly after that, um, guys like Edwin Hubble, does that name sound familiar? Hubble telescope. Edwin Hubble was making these observations with his telescope and finding that you know, for galaxies that are close by, some are moving towards us and some are moving away from us, but they're definitely not staying put. And as you start looking farther away, the galaxies are all moving away from us and moving at incredible speeds. And the farther away they are, the faster they're moving. The universe was expanding and had a beginning. It took Einstein 14 years to finally acknowledge that the insertion of the cosmological constant was a mistake and that the universe wasn't back to the same. Now, do any physics majors in here? No physics majors. All right, so if we did a sort of physics major, I think it is a physics major. Well, if you take astronomy or physics, you might actually hear things about the cosmological constants still being in. And, and in fact, there is a variable in there now that is called the cosmological constant, but it's defined very differently now. It's not inserted to stop expansion. It's inserted to tweak the rate of expansion, to try to model how fast or how slow that expansion is occurring. But in fact, the universe is expanding, and Einstein's reluctance to accept that was based on his inherent philosophical viewpoint. One of the things that that tells me is that being a genius is not sufficient to prevent anyone from the philosophical bias that leads them down the wrong path, whether it's in science or in life. All right, last one. Modern science, and the Bible mutually exclusive, this is primarily getting at some of the more recent uh, debates over things like the age of the Earth and evolution. This is this dichotomy is promoted by several different camps. On one side, you would have things like the American Atheist Society, the Atheist Alliance International, or the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science. They would heartily concur. These things are mutually exclusive. These folks would agree with them. 
Answers in Genesis, Institute of Creation Research, Creation Research Society, Creation Ministries International, also will argue that modern scientific understanding is completely at odds and irreconcilable with the Bible. Now, these groups here will make this kind of an argument. So this is a cartoon that comes from Answers in Genesis. It says that there is a biblical versus humanistic worldview where we're all looking at the same data, but if you're wearing your humanistic glasses, you're going to see it one way. If you're wearing your biblical glasses, you're going to see that evidence as supporting an entirely different set of events. So here's the idea. God is the author of both the Bible and nature. And if I am looking at nature through, and depending on fallible human interpretation, ignoring the Bible, then I'm going to see evidence that suggests the earth is very old. But if my worldview is correct, and I am willing to look through the lens of the Bible, I'm going to see that same evidence as actually supporting a young earth. And I would suggest that there's something very important missing from this paper. What do you think? Do you see anything that's missing? Working through nature and looking through the Bible. Uh, like it's the other way around, working through nature to the Bible? Uh, yeah, we could do that. But, you mean that? <laughs> yeah. yeah the, the, if one is to assume that the Bible is true and authoritative and infallible, that doesn't mean that my understanding of it is going to be infallible. That there's a fallible and human interpretation that applies to this as well. And it may in fact be that if I understand this correctly, then I may actually find that nature reflects an old earth with a biblical perspective. Let's suppose that with this in mind, we back up in history a little bit to those days when, in fact, it did seem that religion was harming the advance of science. Back when we were wrestling about whether the sun was the center of the solar system or the earth was. But we had scriptures like this, Ecclesiastes saying that the sun rises and sets and hastens to its place to rise there again. Looks like the earth is in one place and the sun's doing the traveling. Psalm 19.6, the sun, its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them. Joshua 10 talks about a battle where Joshua said that the sun would stand still. So the sun stood still, the moon stopped, and the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. I can say the earth stopped, but the sun and the moon stopped. Uh, just two more here. Psalm 93, indeed the world is firmly established, it will not be moved. For he established the earth upon its foundation so that it will not totter forever and ever. Now there's two, uh, there's two sets of possible understandings of scripture in these verses. One is, say just with these, is a uh, more of a spiritual interpretation that says, look, God created this world. He is not going to abandon it. It is firmly established. It's in his care. The other adds on to that and says, this is also a, a statement about the nature of nature. That if the Bible addresses nature, it's accurately teaching about that natural function. And so if a question comes up about what's the center of the earth, of the, the solar system, the earth or the sun, God has spoken in <coughs> the earth. So along comes guys, somebody like Galileo Galilei, that says, eh, not so fast. We've got quite a bit of growing evidence now that the sun is not the center of the solar system. Excuse me, the earth isn't. It's actually the sun. And guys like uh, Roberto Bellamino was a cleric who vigorously opposed Galileo on scriptural grounds. Now, ironically, this is often characterized as a science as if it were an atheistic science versus the Bible. Nothing of the sort was going on. 
Galileo firmly reaffirmed the authority of Scripture, and he never once said, science is right, the Bible's wrong. He simply argued, we've been reading the Bible wrongly. Now, if we were to apply what some modern folks have said to this ancient problem, we have guys that firmly agreed with uh, the cardinal, such as John MacArthur, that says any scripture, and scripture always speaks with absolute authority. It is as authoritative when it instructs us as it when it commands us. It is as true when it tells the future as when it records the past. Although it is not a textbook on science, whenever it intersects with scientific data, it speaks with the same authority as when giving moral precepts. So one would think that if John MacArthur read those verses, that he would insist that the Earth is the center of the solar system. Now, to my knowledge, well, it's not to say no Christians argue that the Earth is the center of the solar system. But I just remembered that I was actually getting a well drill a couple of years ago, and the driller who was I was chatting up with actually mentioned this absurdity of the, the Earth going around the sun because clearly you could look and see the sunrise and the sunset. And I just didn't go there. I just have to <laughs> no, I'm not going to have that argument. <laughs> so if I applied this principle, I'd be left with insisting that the Bible is teaching that the Earth is the center of the universe. And if we had cartoons, this is anachronistic, they didn't have these kinds of cartoons back then, but if, if we did, we might see something like this from the equivalent of Answers in Genesis of the day that said, God's, uh, we have this verse, forever, Lord, your word is settled in heaven, where in this case, addition of science becomes subtraction, where we have God's perfect eternal word plus man's fallible changing opinion, earth revolves around the sun, we have to cancel out the scripture. Or we might say, a recipe for theological jello. Mix God's, mix God's perfect, unchanging word with man's fallible, ever-changing opinions, warning you can't stand on theological jello. That's what we'd be left with. Okay, so getting back to this, this awareness that, well, Christians don't really think that the Earth is the center of the solar system. What happened? Well, if we just look at one of those verses, People allowed science to simply raise the question, not is scripture true or false, but have we been reading it correctly? Well, notice that the, in this one, indeed the world is firmly established, it will not be moved. For thousands of years, they assumed that that was a statement about the stability, about being in God's providence, as well as a statement about the function of nature. Galileo comes along, raises the question, maybe the second part was never really intended. Which causes people to go back and look at scripture again and say, is there something within scripture that tells me that that might be true? And we notice this will not be moved. And realize that's the same Hebrew word, moat, that's found in Psalm 16 where King David says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Do you think David was implying that he had stood in one position and he's never going to step outside of that little box again? That he's physically, geographically not going to be moved? No, we realize that that, that statement is profoundly spiritual in nature. And very likely the same intended meaning up here. That this is not a statement about geography. It's a statement about God's providential care. So fundamentally, we didn't need science in order to understand scripture. They always understood those to be about God's providential care. They just added on this extra thinking that it was also talking about the function of nature, which it turns out it really wasn't. So uh, I believe that what we saw going on at the time of Galileo is being played out again with questions about the age of the Earth and evolution. 
if you want to know my thoughts on those two things, you can either read this or you can invite me back. Questions in our department when we have uh, theses or dissertation defenses, and we get to the question and answer arm. Sometimes those things can go those can go on for an hour and a half, <laughs> and, and people that are sitting in the room start thinking, yeah, I don't know, this is this. and if you feel like you've heard enough, I will not be offended at all if you just slip away. But if you got questions. Uh, Yes. Oh, um, I guess the way that you present this is very much like a philosophical argument, and it seems like a metaphysical one of that. Do you find your work, you do it more for the geological and scientific community in that sense, or for the philosophical community? And who do you find reading your work more? Um, well, <laughs> my research is very geological, scientific in, in, uh, in its, and it's all directed towards scientific journals. Uh, my avocation, if you will, a passion for people who are struggling with these issues of, of does life have any meaning? Um, can I be thinking rationally about that there might be more than just the, this material world, and particularly is are the claims of the Bible and Jesus Christ true? <coughs> my my writings that are related to that are mostly aimed at the Christian community, and to a lesser degree at the at the scientific community. So I've given a couple of talks at national meetings <coughs> of the Geological Society of America, where I've argued that that their approach to science advocacy is wrong because it's a conflict model. And it's basically advocating, like some of those books that I put up, of how you can explain religion through naturalistic mechanisms and basically dismiss it. And I've tried to suggest that if you really want the science to be advanced, you need to recognize that there are limits to the questions that science can answer and to actually be open to the possibility that there may be something beyond nature. Then you'll find people that, that have religious convictions be much more receptive to the scientific enterprise. Yeah, but, but a book like this is, is directed principally at a Christian audience. Or they're, they're trying to, they're, they're wrestling with this question, can I actually believe in an old earth and evolution and still believe the Bible's true? Awesome. 